All right, I'd like to welcome everyone back. This is going to be our second chapter that we're going to look at in fourth quarter. Um, it's going to be our second of many chapters we're going to try to squeeze into this quarter. Uh, chapter 22 is going to focus on a group of animals called the echinoderms. And down below you'll notice we have a starfish. Um, the starfish is just one of the four members we're going to look at in this particular chapter. Now, if you look at the word echinoderm, you're going to notice that the um, first part of this word, echino, is going to refer to an animal that is somewhat prickly. In other words, it sort of has um, a surface that is um, covered possibly in spines. Now again, it's possibly because it depends on the type of echinoderm that you're looking at. Now again, if you notice the last part of this word, derms, is going to refer to the skin of the animal. So that's what we're going to use to partially help us identify um, the various animals that you're going to find in this group. Now this is a really interesting group of animals that have quite a few characteristics that make them relatively unique. And if you look over here on the right, we have four different representations of different types of echinoderms. Um, this one right here is a brittle star. This is a typical sea star. And I believe this fuzzy picture is a sea urchin. And this is going to be a sea cucumber, which even though it doesn't look like it actually belongs to this group. Now, most members of this group will have what we consider a calcareous skeleton, which means the skeleton is primarily calcium-based. As we had said in the um, beginning of the screencast, their um, skeleton is going to be somewhat spiny. Um, the skeleton itself is kind of considered an endoskeleton, kind of transitioning from an exo to an endoskeleton, mainly because they have these plates that are embedded in the dermal layer of the animal. Now, something else that really makes this group unique is something called a water vascular system. And this system is typically used by the animal either for locomotion or it could possibly be used to actually feed as well. Now, they also possess something called pedicellaria. And these are sort of like very, very super tiny little claws that you're going to find along the surface of the animal. And they also have something called dermal branchia. Now, if you notice, again, we have this word derm, which is going to refer to the skin. And branchia actually refers to um, sort of a respiratory type of structure. So these little dermal branchia are going to help these animals to actually breathe. Now, they do possess something called pentaradial symmetry. And that's primarily in the adults. And the easiest way to recognize this is to look right over here at the starfish. Uh, penta is going to refer to five. And if you notice, we have one, two, three, four, and five. And it's going to be a radial symmetry. So we have that center disc, and we have these arms or rays radiating um, from that center. So it's considered pentaradial symmetry. Now, of course, if you notice this one right here, doesn't look quite like this one. And again, this one up here definitely doesn't look like this one. So there can definitely be some differences in that symmetry among the different groups that we're going to look at in echinoderms. Now, in regards to diversity, as I had said, there are four primary groups that we're going to focus on. Now, the anatomy piece for this chapter is primarily going to look at the sea stars. So most of the anatomical information I'm going to require you guys to know is going to focus on that particular group. Now, the sea stars belong to the asteroidae, or they're called the asteroids, and they are mostly considered predators. Uh, most of the time, these animals right here, you're going to find them maybe sort of like um, maybe on the bottom. In other words, they're not going to be sort of pelagic. In other words, you're not going to find most sea stars in open water. Um, you'll find them usually on hard, rocky surfaces, but there are a few that actually do inhibit relatively um, soft and sandy um, environments. Now, the Ophiuroids, or the brittle stars, are very similar to the sea stars. And the brittle star is the one that you see right over here on the right-hand side. Um, the way that they're actually put together is somewhat similar to the sea star, but they're considered brittle because the arms are actually very, very delicate. And in fact, they have many joints. And that's kind of what causes these animals to have arms that can be really easily um, broken off. But... One thing about the brittle stars is that it's really easy for them to move throughout their environment when compared to the typical sea star. Um, they're typically scavengers, browsers, or they can sometimes have some commensalistic relationships with some other animals. In other words, sometimes what they'll do is they'll actually steal food um, from their host. But they're pretty unique and they're pretty interesting animals. Now the third group is the Holothurians, and these are called the sea cucumbers. And you can see the sea cucumber right down here towards the bottom. Now these are rather nondescript, kind of plain looking members of this group. 
and a lot of times they don't really move around too much and in fact a lot of the things that you would notice among the other members of this um, particular phylum you're not going to see here or they're going to be very very reduced they're going to be really hard to pick up on now sea cucumbers are mostly considered suspension or deposit feeders in other words they're going to sort of filter things out of the water as they feed now the echinoids or the sea urchins like you see right over here these are often found on sort of a hard bottom type of habitat while there may be some other members like the sand dollars for example that actually prefer somewhat of sandy um, substrate now they feed on detritus in other words they feed on decaying organic matter now to begin our discussion on form and function as i said we're going to focus on the sea stars we're going to begin with the external features and as we had said before, they have something called pentaradial symmetry. So they do have that center disc that you would see right here. And outward from that disc, you're going to find the various arms. Um, we tend to call them arms. We don't tend to call them legs. And sometimes we'll even use the word rays to describe um, each of these extensions. Now the body is typically somewhat flattened and um, somewhat flexible, depending on the type of um, star that you're looking at and they do tend to be pigmented which means that they do tend to hold color and if you ever have gone to the tide pools before you'll notice that sometimes you can find starfish of lots of different patterns and lots of different colors and actually they're really good at blending in with their environment as well and so that definitely has an impact on how they might appear now they do have what we consider a ciliated epidermis and we're going to talk a little bit more about the epidermis as we kind of make our way through the screencast now in this case for this group of animals the mouth is going to be on the underside or what we consider the oral surface. So these animals are going to have both an oral and what we consider an aboral side. So the oral surface is going to be on the underside right here. So this is where you're going to find the mouth of the animal. Now the ambulacrum is going to run from the mouth to the tip of each arm. Now that comes from the word ambulacra, which basically means a path. And so the area that they are referring to is going to be right here. So that would be considered the ambulacral area and again it runs from the mouth to the very tip of the arms now what we'll often do is we'll talk about something called an ambulacral groove and that's going to be right here and that's where you're going to find the majority of the um, tube feet that allow this animal to move from place to place now there typically are going to be five arms but again depending on the species um, you can definitely have um, starfish that actually have many many more sometimes 15 sometimes 20 and as I had said, the ambulacral groove, which I had just mentioned, is again going to run from the mouth to the tip. And it's kind of that um, path that you would see right through here. And as I had said, it does contain those two feet, which are used in locomotion. Now, in addition to talking about the two feet that you would find protruding from that ambulacral groove, you're also going to notice as you kind of dig a little bit deeper in your um, starfish that they have something called a radial nerve that's going to be located typically in the center of that groove. And since it is a nerve, it's going to be used to help to sort of regulate um, the movement of the animal. In other words, the response of the animal to um, various stimuli within the environment. Now they're also going to possess something called ossicles and that ossicle is going to be um, basically used in conjunction with other types of dermal tissue to cover the various structures that we're going to look at in this animal. Now, as we had said they have both an oral and an aboral surface. Now that oral side was the underside of the animal so that was going to be the mouth of the animal. The aboral is going to be on the um, what we would consider the top of the animals. In other words, that would be right around here. So this would be considered the aboral side. Now at the base of the spines, you're going to be groups of very small pincer-like um, structures called pedicellaria. And we had just briefly mentioned those at the beginning of the screencast. Now they're super, super tiny. And I do have a picture down here in the lower right here. And you can see these pedicellaria. And I'm going to sort of zoom in on that just a bit so you guys can see that. And um, again, they literally look like pinchers. And their main job is to keep the body surface free of debris. Now, in addition to the pedicellaria, they're also going to have something called papulae. Now, that's another word for those dermal branchia that we had looked at a little bit earlier. Sometimes they're often called skin gills. And again, these are going to be very soft, rather thin projections that are going to be lined with peritoneum, and their main function is in respiration. Now, on that aboral side, that outside of the um, starfish, you're going to notice they have something called a madreporite. And that's going to be the entry point um, for water as it makes its way into that water vascular system that we had mentioned early on. And again, we'll talk more about the water vascular system as we get a little further into this chapter. 
Now the endoskeleton of these animals, as you can see right over here, is going to be right under the epidermis and it's considered mesodermal in nature. So remember we had talked about what we consider an endoderm, ectoderm, and a mesoderm type of tissue. Well this skeleton is going to be derived from that mesodermal tissue. Now they do have small calcareous plates, again as we had said they're often called ossicles, that are going to be embedded within that epidermis. Now what you'll find is they're typically bound together by sort of an unusual form of what we consider a mutable or a changeable type of collagen and they call this collagen um, catch collagen. In other words it's used to catch or to hold on to, to bind those plates together. And it is mutable which means it can actually change um, its chemical structure and change into a different type of collagen that might be used for something else. Now muscles in the body wall are going to move the rays. Now remember the rays are going to be the arms of the animal and partially close the ambulacral grooves that you would find on the um, oral side of the animal. So those now if you notice the word coelom is coming back in and I don't want you guys to get confused about this because again a coelom is simply a body cavity. Um, in this particular side we're going to look at the coelom, we're going to look at excretion, and we're going to look at respiration. Um, when you look at the coelom or the body cavity inside of these animals it's typically filled with fluid which would make sense since we are talking about an aquatic animal. They have a ciliated peritoneal lining of the coelom which is going to be used to help to circulate that fluid. So it's going to be ciliated so it has this very tiny hairs that's going to allow that fluid to be moved throughout the cavity and throughout the body of the animal. And it's going to be moved into those papillae. And remember those papillae are going to be those um, dermal branchia or those respiratory structures that you would find on the surface of the animal. And if you notice it says respiratory gases and ammonia, ammonia would probably be a waste product in these animals, are going to diffuse across those papillae and the two feet which are going to be found on the underside. Now some waste products are going to be picked up by a special type of cell called a coelom oocyte. And these are going to actually be movable cells. In other words, they're going to be able to migrate throughout the fluid that's found within these animals. And their function is to seek out, to consume, to pick up, and to carry off some of the waste that's going to be produced in the bodies of these animals. Now, as I had said before, the water vascular system is one piece of these animals that really makes them relatively unique when you compare them to the other groups that we've studied in class. Now, this system is going to consist of canals, the tube feet, and the dermal ossicles that we had looked at a little bit earlier. And the main function of the system is going to be locomotion, food gathering, respiration, and of course excretion of waste. Now, as we had sort of kind of briefly mentioned a little bit earlier, it's going to open to the outside at the madreporite on the aboral side. So again, it's really important that you guys make sure that you um, understand the difference between the oral and the aboral because that word is going to be used quite a bit as we make our way through our discussion in this group. Now the madreporite, you can see that located right here. This is going to be the madreporite and it illustrates it right here. So that's going to be sort of the entryway or the exit way for that system. Now that madreporite is going to extend to a structure called the stone canal which eventually will extend to join the ring canal and that's going to encircle the mouth. So over here you can, let's see, let's go down here actually to this one. You can see the madreporite being located right here. The stone canal is going to be the tube that's eventually going to join the ring you would find in the aboral side of the animal. And as we had said it's going to encircle the mouth. Now, don't forget, this is the aboral side. The oral side is going to be the underside, so you really can't see the mouth being illustrated here, except for maybe that very small dot that you see right there. Now the radial canals are going to diverge from the ring canal and actually extend into each ray. So the radial canals are going to be these canals that you find right through here. These are going to be considered the radial canals. And again, all of this is going to be part of that water vascular system. Now, there's going to be four or five pairs of what we consider Tiedemann's bodies. Now, this largely depends, again, on the type of um, echinoderm that you're looking at. There's going to be a lot of stars that aren't going to have these. But these are going to attach to the ring canal, and they actually might produce those special cells that we had talked about earlier that actually allow the removal of waste. In other words, the celomocytes are the ones that seek out, grab, take in the waste, 
and move them to the outside of the animal. Now, continuing our discussion about the water vascular system, there may also be a structure called a pulleyan vesicle that may also be attached to this system. In fact, oftentimes you'll find these pulleyan vesicles more prominent in the um, sea cucumbers that we're going to talk about towards the um, end of this chapter. And their main function is going to be in fluid storage and regulation of the internal pressure of the system itself. Pressure is a big component here because that pressure is going to determine, um, for example, the um, protrusion or the retraction of those two feet, which again are pretty necessary because they help that animal move throughout the environment and possibly to feed. Now the inner end of each of the two feet are going to be called the ampullae, and you're going to be able to see these ampullae when you guys dissect your um, starfish in class. Now these lie within the coelom or that body cavity that we've been looking at. Now the outer end of each tube foot is going to bear a sucker. Now I've got to remind you, again, it depends on the type of echinoderm that we're looking at, whether or not you will actually find that structure. For example, when you talk about the brittle stars, they do not have um, suckers at the end of their tube feet. Now the water vascular system is going to operate hydraulically and as I had said before with um, the fluid that's found within the system, one of the main functions is to push that fluid to increase the pressure and to allow those two feet to be um, basically protruded from the animal's body. In essence, that's going to be hydraulic pressure. Now the muscles in the ampullae are going to contract, forcing fluid into and extending the podium. And podia or podium is just another name for the tube feet. So now contractions of longitudinal muscles in the tube foot is going to retract it or actually bring it in. That's going to force the fluid back into the ampullae. Now I do understand that in the echinoderms there's going to be a lot of a new vocabulary that you guys haven't been exposed to in previous chapters. Um, but what you really need to do is when you get to your dissection you really need to take your time and think about the function of each of those parts and of course think about how they're related to each other. Because again when you looked at the water vascular system, there's lots of different parts that are going to work together to provide various functions for that animal. Alright, so that's going to finish up our very first screencast for chapter 22, and I want to remind you it's really important for you guys to make sure that you get your um, study guides done before you come to class because you need every single minute that you can get in lab. We have a lot of content to cover in a very short amount of time.